that's just simply to say that, that my concepts of this thesis as knowing and my ideas of, of, of what knowledge is and how it's produced have been very much influenced by this radical constructivist tradition. They're much more serious than I am and much more sober, um, but they're <laughs> in every sense. But um, I do recommend that you read them. And to give you one example, again, um, Umberto Maturana and, and Francesco Varela are, are incredible thinkers about sentience, awareness, and, and the constructed condition of, of how we know and how it changes us. And we do change in relationship to experience. Our biology modifies. Our eyes become resensitized. The capacity of the retina and of the rods and cones to perceive alters in relationship to certain kinds of tasks and experience. It doesn't stay stable. We are adaptive creatures. And that's what he means by codependent relations of knowing to circumstance. And the example that's always used in constructivism is the example of pain. Wh where is pain? Wh where is pain? Is pain in the world? Do you get pain? Is pain given to you? OK. Um, the relationship of any individual to a stimulus that produces pain will vary depending on the circumstances in which that stimulus is received. The same stimulus given to another human being will produce a different experience. And so cognition of pain produces pain in a relationship with a set of stimuli. But that relationship isn't fixed. It changes and emerges. It's constructed. We construct pain. We understand pain psychologically within a set of constructions. One of the you know, benefits and horrors of being human beings is that we can actually adjust our set point for pain. We can come to tolerate intolerable conditions because we have that capacity to adjust. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship that stays static and stable. So as psychological beings, we construct our world in a set of relations and codependencies that constantly emerges, and we mutate and adapt. So when I talk about aesthetics, I mean all that. <laughs> OK, so that's the aesthetics part. On the materiality part, materiality, um, I just want to say a couple of, uh, of, of really basic things and then touch on a few points of my own practice and then answer questions. Materiality is a term that's recently come to have a great deal of trendiness within various kinds of discussions. And I think it's good that it has, because it's returning us to certain kinds of questions about how the meaning that we um, produce in relationship to received materials is actually produced in relationship to the material substrate, the forms of inscription, notation, the mark making, you know, what's there, the thereness of what's there. Um, but most of the materialities, now I'll be a little nasty. OK, so most of the, ma the <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time. Most of the concepts of materiality that have come into play are concepts of materiality that privilege a kind of reessentializing of the value of materials. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's talk about materiality. If I look at an inscription that's been put onto a wall, and it's been carved into a piece of stone, and it's had copper lettering inlaid into a plaque, then there's a sense that somehow I can go back to that plaque and analyze the intrinsic properties of copper, of stone, of marble, of carving, look at the, you know, sort of social, and certainly the social history is important here, but that there's somehow an intrinsic literal value to material substrates. And materialities have become extremely literal in the way that they look at, uh, literal and mechanistic, in the way that they examine materiality. Well, the problem with that, and here's my critique, is that materiality is not literal. In other words, I can take a set of material elements, whether they are paper or stone or letterpress or offset, and they don't carry intrinsic semantic value. I mean, for all that I will insist that the graphical inflection of a work is a performance of a work, if I take a Xerox copy of something from a Norton anthology of verse, and then I put it next to the printed copy of the Norton Anthology of Verse, there's a difference, but it's not a difference that really makes a difference very much. Okay, it might make a difference over time, it might make a difference in circumstances, but to posit a kind of orthodox, you know, uh, literal materiality is, is silly, okay? It's, it's trivializing the idea of materiality. Instead, I think we want to go back to a notion of materiality that's performative. Okay, so what does performative materiality mean? What performative materiality suggests, and it goes back to my theories of, of, of aesthesis and, and knowledge as knowing, is that any formal <laughs> structure contains with it and within it certain provocations, certain associations, certain 
cues for reading or for viewing or for listening um, that will provoke in the instance of the reader or viewer or listener's production of that text certain kinds of responses more often than certain other kinds of responses. Okay, so there's a kind of you know normative distribution of response. Most people reading, we talked about this point this morning. Most people reading Peter Rabbit in the typeface in which it is set, some little you know kind of school book hand, are going to read Peter Rabbit in a particular way. All right, they're not going to read it as a goth novel. In most cases, <laughs> I'm not saying that you couldn't, but most people are not. Okay, if I set Peter Rabbit in black letter, okay, and give it a kind of you know vampiristic font. Little Peter might shift a bit in terms of how we perceive him, and a kind of you know interesting inflection of that text will take place. So within a normative distribution, there will be certain ways in which materialities, in that sense, because the choice of a font is a material choice, will actually inflect the reading. You will associate, because of your cultural and historical training, certain kinds of documents and traditions and so forth with those things, but they're not inherent. Um, they're not inherent any more than the roots of a morpheme are inherent in the language. Okay, this is the structuralist move. We understand from the 20th century forward that, in fact, elements are in play in relationship to each other. They're, they're not absolute. They can't be recovered absolutely. We don't get origins back just through the reading of a work. So when I talk about materiality, I'm really interested, again, in this kind of you know, sense of what is the performative range of provocation that a particular set of elements brings into play. And how can we as scholar readers then recover more knowledge of that? Um, I mean, okay, so here I'll be really mean. Like the Kelly Writer's House typeface, all right? <laughs> when was Kelly Writer's House built? <laughs> okay, when was that typeface designed? Uh-huh, okay, so that's an arts and crafts typeface on a house that is not an arts and crafts house. <laughs> and so I come in here and I go, oh my God, oh my <laughs> God, what, Charles Reddy Macintosh, you know, why is that the typeface? And I'm looking at this house and it's so not, okay? So, um, <laughs> all right, so for me, uh, for me it's like, why did they, they misbranded this, okay? This is so bizarre, okay? So, you know, go to Thoroughgood's inventory of typefaces and pick a Thoroughgood, you know, <laughs> display face from the mid-19th century and rebrand Kelly Writer's House. Well, there's a reason why they use that font, because, again, there's a kind of association with what that font suggests to us about the values of craft recovered in a modern moment and given a particular value in relationship to a whole wide range of practices. So, okay, that's fine. But again, it's as anachronistic, you know, as showing up wearing bloomers in order to, you know, uh, do a performance of an Elvis Costello song. Um, you know, is it right or is it wrong? Well, there's no right or wrong, it's just an effect. Okay, but understanding the inventory of effects um, takes us right back to where I started a minute ago, which is the notion of aesthetics as the development of an experiential base against which your own capacity to discriminate and make, you know, really nuanced, um, you know, sort of processing of your own experience comes into play. So that would be my full circle from aesthetics.